morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, the monthly uh, breakfast, uh, roundtable breakfast. We used to meet in person uh, from 9-11 until March 2020. When the pandemic occurred, we um, started doing these breakfasts virtually, and these breakfasts are recorded. We keep re referring to them as breakfasts as if we're still meeting over um, bagels and coffee, but um, these are the round tables, and um, they are co-sponsored by the Association for Conflict Resolution of Greater New York and the City University of New York Dispute Resolution Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'm Maria Volpe, and I am a professor <clears throat> excuse me, at, at John Jay. This morning is our 274th breakfast since 9-11. Yeah, um, the numbers keep growing uh, every month. It, it is amazing. The recordings are available on two websites, www.acrgmy.org, and uh, soon on the CUNY Dispute Resolution Center's website that has been under construction forever. Um, these breakfasts are put together each month by a wonderful team of colleagues, including Matthew Latimer, Nikki Borofsky, uh, Emily Skinner, Chloe Choi, and Thurston Pugh. Each month, we are incredibly fortunate to have wonderful colleagues who join us as presenters, many who are on the call now, who've been part of this. It, it's beginning to feel like a monthly happening uh, since 9-11. Uh, this morning, we're so delighted to have you join us, uh, Dr. Claire Fowler. Many of you know her from Mediate.com. Uh, it's really early uh, in Oregon, so we are even more uh, grateful for you getting up at the wee hours to be with us for tech support at, <laughs> yes, coffee. Um, she joined us at um, 7.30 this morning, which was 4.30 her time. Um, thank you so much for being with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Nikki Borofsky who is going to more formally introduce Claire. Take it away, Nikki. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, and and thank you so much to, to, to Dr. Fowler. It is truly an honor to, to have you. I will keep my introduction short, but there's a lot to say. We are very fortunate to have a truly vibrant and venerated dispute resolution luminary uh, speaking to us for today's ACRGNY and CUNY Dispute Resolution Roundtable Breakfast, 274th. It's, uh, it's not a small hurdle. Uh, we often talk about who the successful messengers are for the world of conflict resolution. And I think after hearing uh, Dr. Fowler today, you will join me in agreeing that she is somebody who is truly breaking through the rhetoric, the acronym, and and powerfully sharing the toolbox and the and the real benefits and potential of the kind of work that we might do every day as uh, professionals, students, and practitioners in the conflict resolution space. Dr. Claire Fowler is the Executive Vice President of Mediate.com. If you haven't visited me Mediate.com, go now. Um, she received a doctorate in designing dispute resolution systems for small businesses from Pepperdine University Graduate School of Education and Organizational Leadership. She has her Master's of Dispute Resolution from the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution at Pepperdine. And uh, she also works as a teacher, ADR practitioner, writer, and speaker. So her uh, experience is truly far and wide in many of the realms of where this work has an impact. She is the managing editor and caseload manager at Mediate.com. So those of you um, who have ideas and want to share your thoughts and experiences, look up how to pitch and, and submit on Mediate.com. Um, and she also teaches. Uh, Drawing today from her rich experiences and insights, uh, she's going to share with us uh, some of the interesting things that she has uh, written about in her latest book, Rising Above Office Conflict. So we will join her on a little bit of a journey today as we explore conflict neuroplasticity. 
I am counting on her to bend all of our minds, hopefully not break them, um, <laughs> and and really uh, challenge us to see the benefits that uh, this kind of uh, uh, an evaluation and introspection and study can can give us. I just had to have a, a, a small note. Um, I haven't read her book yet. I uh, have ordered it now, and uh, you will all have a, a great link to, to order it at a discount after today's talk. But um, as a trained chef myself, I really appreciate the way uh, in which, from reviews that I read, she she gives us a recipe of excellent, uh, easily digestible, funny, relatable ways to learn um, the, the the powerful research and um, insights that she has has gained and distilled. So without further ado <laughs> or, or teasers, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Claire Fowler. Claire, the 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 floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Nikki. That was that was incredible. That was so kind. Um, <clears throat> what an honor to get to be with all of you today. This is incredibly exciting. Um, let me say one quick thing. I just want to add to that, Nikki. You were you were mentioning about the book and <clears throat> how it the purpose of it was to be relatable. So I did my undergrad, my master's, my doctorate in workplace mediation. And I just saw Harry in the background with all of, with the bookshelves of all the beautiful books. And that's what that's what my bookshelves look like. I have all these amazing books that quite a few of you have written, and they were incredible. and i and I loved reading them when I was getting my doctorate. And then I got married, and my husband would come home and he would complain about his day, right? Oh, this coworker, this micromanager, uh, how am I going to deal with this? And I'm looking at all of these fantastic books, thinking, He's not going to read these, but like all the knowledge that he needs is right here. So what I tried to do was um, just take little bits from from my experience working with different mediations and take some of this fantastic knowledge that a lot of you have put together. And I, I try to just put together a very simple guide. So for anyone, it, the purpose of it, that it's it doesn't have to be a conflict resolution professional. You don't need a master's in this, but I just wanted people to have a guidebook to be able to pick it up and say, oh, I'm dealing with a micromanager or this person is just a nonstop jerk and I can't figure out why and we can't connect. I just wanted them to be able to say, oh, let me turn to that chapter. Here's three steps that I can easily implement today. So that was the whole goal. I just wanted something that that like all of us are, are so rich and and lucky to be able to <clears throat> come here and have these conversations but there's a lot of employees out there who who are going through some pretty hard stuff and they don't get to come so that was the purpose of writing this i just I wanted a guidebook that everyone could pick up okay so thank you nikki all right so this is what i want to talk about today floor is lava and so i just wanted to add a couple of things here uh, yes, vpmediate.com. I've been doing peer mediation, or I took my first peer mediation class in third grade, and I was just hooked. I loved it. I thought this was revolutionary. Um, my father's an author, so it just it was kind of it just made sense. I grew up in a author household. He was writing all the time, and so I combined that with with how excited I was about dispute resolution and mediation, and then went on to do. This is a tough word the phenomenological study of workplace mediation. In other words, what's really going on? How come people are continuing to argue at work and what can we do about that? So that was the purpose of the dissertation. All right, so that's me. This is what I wanna talk about today. I want to look at what happens with trauma, how it shapes our brain, but also realizing that it's not a permanent thing, right? We don't have to say that, oh, this is our identity. I'm just stuck with this now because I've been traumatized, but how we can start to take control of that and reshape it. When we are in the role of mediators and clients are coming to our table, is it our job to reshape their brain? Absolutely not. But I think that a lot of the work that we are doing naturally, right, the basic stuff that we learned in our 40-hour basic mediation training is it's kind of the building block. It's the foundation for reshaping our brain and helping people to heal after trauma. So that's what I wanna talk about today. All right, oh, and um, Nikki, I don't know if you're able to share that link. Um, this is roughly my outline, but I put this in a Word document. So uh, if not, we can send that out afterwards just so you have a place to be taking notes. All right, so 
when I was younger, um, I, uh, I didn't get picked for a softball team. And I remember somebody saying to me, oh, it's okay. Girls aren't really athletes. It, it's not your fault. You're fine. And I was young, right? I was impressionable. And at that time, you don't really have a filter. You just kind of accept as truths what people drop into your brain. And so it did. It dropped into my brain and the little roots started spreading out into the rest of my world. And it was one of those very clear memories because it was fairly traumatic. Why was it traumatic? It was because I had a sense of myself, right? This is my identity. I love to play softball. I wasn't the best, let's just be honest, but I loved it. I loved being out there and being a part of the team and it was sunny and and we're moving and it was great. And then somebody said that and it it rocked me a little bit and I had to I had to change how I saw myself and I had to change my worldview and realize, oh, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that girls couldn't be athletes. And I'm sure it was just this this tiny innocent comment, but it's one of those that kind of trickled its way down in there. And, and it, it affected me for quite a while. <sighs> Trauma can often be like this. It can be a, a singular, horrible, memorable event, or it can be something like that, where it's just a little seed that somebody plants when you are forming, but it affects you, right? It affects your behaviors, your identity, how you see the world. Trauma can also be pretty low grade and consistent. I do a lot of workplace mediation and I'm dealing with people who are suffering from this ongoing, consistent, low-grade trauma that has definitely affected their behaviors, their identity, and how they see the world. So just keep that in mind. It could be this big event that happened. It could be something that, that shaped you and, and rocked you when you were younger, or it's just this low-grade, consistent experience. Okay? So as we know, when things are painful, we avoid them. And this idea that girls can't be athletes was painful, right? I, I was embarrassed. I didn't know girls couldn't be athletes, right? I was pretty young. And just the idea of doing something and putting myself out there and, and being embarrassed again was really hard. So this, this became a lava spot in my brain. So my brain started to avoid this. We do this with a lot of things, right? If somebody calls you out on something, if... Uh, if you've made a mistake, if somebody said something incredibly painful to you, if you failed, if you don't know how to do something, that becomes that hot spot in your brain. So this becomes a trauma point in your brain. What happens when we have these trauma points? Your brain avoids them, and it usually avoids them by taking one of these three steps. It can, and I'm, I would love to hear in the chat what you think your brain typically does. I've definitely found that my brain turtles. So if this is a, the trauma spot, right? This is that idea that, oh, girls can't be athletes. Whoever said that, I just want to go back and sock them. Anyway, so they said girls can't be athletes. And so whenever I would get close to that thought in my brain, like if there was a tryout for, I don't know, a volleyball team or something, my brain would just kind of turtle underneath it and it would avoid it because it didn't my brain is the type that I don't want to be seen as difficult, right? I want to be a people pleaser. I don't want to make a big deal about something. And I just wanted to avoid it. So I would downplay it and kind of turtle underneath it. We have the other brain style that thunders over it. It does that by saying, nope, this is just the way it is. I'm still not addressing the conflict. Instead, I'm powering over it, right? I'm telling you, bam, this is the way it is. I'm going to be an athlete. You have to deal with it. We're not having a conversation about anything. We're not learning or growing, but that thunder personality is, is shutting down the conversation by just, bam, by, by throwing down that really aggressive, powerful thought. And then we have people who turn, right? They come up to it and they just instantly go in the opposite direction. So uh, let's say we have these volleyball tryouts and the person says, uh, nope, you know what? I think I'd rather go camping this weekend instead. So these are all common avoidance techniques. Again, I'm typically the turtle. If, if something is really frightening, my brain usually just wants to ignore it and pretend it's not there and go on its merry little way. Um, in the workplace, I'm on the West Coast. So we're, we're very, I don't know, we're much more timid. We're much more boring. I'm kind of, my, my uh, husband and all my in-laws, they're all from the East Coast. 
and they can be much more bold and they can really speak their mind and be honest. And I'm jealous of that. But over on the West Coast, I think we're much more turtlers. I don't know. What would, I'm interested what you all would say, what you're like. Um, so what's going on here is that I have a window of tolerance in my brain. This is the thought that I can handle and still feel like I can tolerate it. I can be in control. Anything that is incredibly painful, that is traumatic, that is outside my window of tolerance. Like if I try to do that thing, then I'm, I just know I'm going to flip out. That is, that is outside of what I can handle. Okay. Making sense so far. So we all have these window of tolerances and, and that's going to look incredibly different for everyone. And of course it changes as we grow. So what's happening um, I'm going to start with a simplistic example. I'm assuming a lot of you have already done this. So if you would please, some of you are on video, so I can see if you're doing this or not. Hold your hand up, tuck your thumb in, fold your fingers over, and this front, the wiggly, wrinkly part, okay, this is our prefrontal cortex, right? It's right here. And then tucked on the inside, we have the amygdala, right? Prefrontal cortex, this is connected to past, so it's connected to our memories, and it's connected to the future. So it can imagine new ideas. It can be creative. This is beautiful. This is the this is the ideal client that you want sitting at your mediation table, right? They can remember how things have been. They can imagine some great outcomes to this agreement. This is perfect. We want someone whose prefrontal cortex is fully engaged. But if we start getting close to that pain point, right? If if the conversation starts getting too close. To that, to that lava in your brain, then of course, what's gonna happen? Your amygdala says, danger Will Robinson, and your amygdala takes over because that's its job. Its job is to protect you from an immediate threat. Uh, again, I live out in Oregon. We live in the country. We, um, we left California and we bought an old Christmas tree farm. And so it's really fun. We can go running around here. And it's actually, it's the perfect place to go running because since it was an old Christmas tree farm, all the trees are, are planted in perfect paths. So we have all these ideal rows to do laps up and down. It's fun. But there's also a lot of cougars that think it's a great running spot. So I'll be running and having this great conversation with my kids. Da, 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 da. And then suddenly you hear like a, a twig snap. And it's, it's amazing how fast your amygdala can say, I'm in charge. I have to protect you from this immediate threat because it's afraid that a cougar is going to jump out and attack me. So what does this look like? So I want to talk about the, the science behind it, but then I want to apply this to our mediation table. What does this look like in our clients? So when our amygdala, when our clients start to get too close to that hot spot, right? When we're starting to get too close to that trauma, then the amygdala takes over, right? The prefrontal cortex flips offline and your amygdala is in charge. And it says, we should do one of these things. We should sunder, right? We should just say, this is the way it is. Or we can turtle and pretend like, no, it's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Or we can turn and go in a completely opposite direction. As I'm sure you've figured out, yes, these correlate to fight, freeze, and flight responses, okay? So I want to, you know, let me pause one second. I just want to double check that I click share sound. I think I did, but let's double check. It does no good to play a video without sound. Right. Now look at, I've just clicked all over the place. Don't you love it when your Zoom controls get in the way? Zoom always chooses freeze for me. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> there we are. Okay. So I just wanted you to, to have a picture here of what's going on. Don't worry. Wow. We're this whole this thing. is new. Oh, yeah. Switch to H&R Block. Yeah. Doing my own taxes like a champ. Right. You can connect live with real experts. I mean, last what year we I used TurboTax and compared to H&R Block, they're so... Do your own taxes and get help from an H&R Block tax pro. So you can watch these little electrical impulses go from synapse to synapse in your brain. It's just amazing the way that it works. 
Not in quick we lost the video. Like right now, now Tim Walsh, I'm a kinesiologist. Excited to be here. Run over. We're seeing Ronald Reagan is operating. What is the speed of thought? It's a great question with a lot of different answers because thoughts can be very quickly. And so it's sending a thought from they can originate from one synapse or from to another at a speed of about 100 people. Dr. Fowler, I want to interrupt just a minute because I know the audio is still playing and it's hard to hear you. Let's talk about the basic but unit But watch of what the happens thought. when you have a, a thunder and a turtle in our conversation. Interacting with each other okay, so we and have our thunder. swapping chemicals between them to communicate. The so it can be said that the most basic unit of thought is a neuron like, fire. Um, Neurons in your brain like consist of, you of cell bodies with dendrites branching out from it, as suddenly... well as an axon that splits Dr. several... Dr. Fowler, we can't hear you! ...sent electrical impulses, but it's not like the electricity in your house that works by passing freely moving electrons, so it's not as instantaneous. Instead, neurons swap ions of different charges Dr. across Fowler. the membrane of the axon. Can by I unmute myself? At the start of the axon by the cell I body. need to stop the, the, the audio the share because we're hearing the commercial. Wait. There we go. I think we when were the signal going gets over to the other. end of the axon, the synaptic bundle will release and you were neurotransmitters I'm just gonna across the synaptic okay. cleft. So, Claire, we're hearing the like, like recap. So, my brain, um, the neurotransmitters brain float to the next neuron's dendrites, and they tell the next neuron how to fire. So, the total time to create a thought, your brain is thinking about 150 meters per second across the Claire, synapse we're, um, is the most basic unit. And, and of course, this yeah, there's great. a lot more about, science it behind more this, but I'm, because I'm just grabbing one slice of it for right now. Gray matter or white matter. Please when somebody's stop. having a fight response, so when they are deciding it's what to what you use for sensory perceptions. We're having some technical difficulties. Hold on for a second. It's dense with cell bodies, and the axons are short and don't have a fatty I, protein I called myelin surrounding and unmuting White myself. matter, on I'm the not other sure hand, somebody doesn't do the me. thought processing, but is vital for connecting we different... We can't hear you. Okay. That's a foul We can't hear you. This is going to be the best time. This is the optic cable and a 56K motor. When a thunder is stopped in your video. It's incredibly fast, so they're at about 200 meters per second. With it, white As matter's I mentioned, action potential can travel I am a up to turtle, 150 right? meters. So my response is to it freeze. Dr. Claire, when I am your video is playing over, I'm, over I'm 176,000 like trauma and I'm starting the to feel like I'm under attack. Get to a meter long, which is good because that means fewer synapses slow like the signal down. A synapse is a gap between a neurons of only 20 right? nanometers. Uh, Some it, translations like, across the synapse can be quite make those connections. Ion channels right away. The whole process can take just a millisecond. I think you need that, and I can't quite remember Another molecule, exactly and what's going on. That secondary messenger opens up the ion channels. That can delay the signal anywhere from 30 milliseconds to a full second. So between axon length, axon type, Dr. and Paul, Nikki, I just want to do a quick check in. We hear the video. Um, individual neuron. We hear the video. We can't hear you. Consider that a single neuron can have lengths. We need to stop the the audio share because we can only hear the. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Oh. I'm frustrating. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't think no, I'm that. so sorry. I hope it was exciting. I think we have some unintentional promotional partners and we'll be uh, reaching out to them for <laughs> <laughs> all of the benefits. Uh, maybe everybody gets a, a free tax consultation from H&R Block now. <laughs> now I understand. Like, so... so yeah, we 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 did we didn't hear the last kind of uh, three to five minutes of what you were saying because there was I'll the do. competing audio from the ads. Thank you, Nikki. All right, and I'll do a quick recap. And your, and your PowerPoint went back to the amygdala behaviors, not even the video, so we couldn't see any of what you were trying to show us. <laughs> right, <laughs> got it, got it. Take, take two. Perfect. Well, good. I had practice doing this the first time, so now I'm all set. All right. So very quickly. Um, when we are, when our brains are thinking at optimal speed, when I've had my coffee and I am excited, then my brain, um, my brain is sending a thought at about 150 meters per second. Okay. When somebody is having a fight response and they have all this additional stuff, right? Because when we have fight responses, then your brain starts sending this additional adrenaline and blood and oxygen to your brain and you're, you're kind of supercharged. Uh, if any of you are trial attorneys, this is what I picture is happening in your brain, that you're in front of the jury and everything is just clicking and you're thinking so fast. And you can say, yes, but where were you the night of April the 14th? Da, da, da. And you can form all of these incredible fast connections because your brain is sending thoughts at 200 meters per second. If you are like me, then when you start to approach conflict, if you start to approach that lava spot in your brain, 
then your brain freezes, right? You become a turtle and you, you just want to withdraw and hide. And for me, I sort of feel like my brain has become mashed potatoes. I just can't quite remember, like, I don't, I, I think I said that, I don't know, I'm not, did we talk about that? I'm not quite sure. And everything is frozen because my brain is sending thoughts at roughly two meters per second. So now just picture what happens if you are the mediator and you have these people sitting at your mediation table and you have a thunderer and you have a turtler, okay? You have the thunderer who's having a fight response. And so they have all this increased adrenaline, epinephrine, blood, oxygen, and their, their brain is sending thoughts incredibly fast. And what's interesting is they're not only sending thoughts fast, but they're also getting a little dopamine hit along with this. How do I know this? Because this is my um, this is my husband's fight style. When we were first married and we would talk through something, right? And and he's from like this big, he's like a a loud family, and they they loved getting to the heart of things and having this connection and really talking through something, and he loved it. That was so exciting for him. I grew up in this little quiet household where like we had tea parties, and if anything was wrong, like we kind of flushed it under the rug and we didn't talk about it. So when I would talk about something, I would freeze, right? I would just feel like a puddle for the next few hours. When he would talk about something, that stinker would whistle. He loved it. I'm like, don't you know? We just, like, we had an argument. What are you doing? But he's got this dopamine hit and he's down in the kitchen getting his coffee and he's whistling because he feels great. He's excited. This was very encouraging for him because now he feels like he's finally making a connection. So again, let's bring that back to the mediation table. You're the mediator, you have a thunderer and you have a turtle. What does this look like? We get what's called the thunder turtle syndrome where you have one person who's the thunderer, right? And they're going to be loud and they're talking through things because they want to, they wanna have this connection. This is exciting. They wanna get down to the heart of it and we're finally talking about this. And so they're they're putting down all these thunder comments like this is the way it is and i'm going to get the house and i'm going to get the car and you're going to sell that and then you can have the kids and and this is great and i've made a decision and the louder they get what happens with the turtle well, we know the turtle goes like this right it starts to hide within its shell and the more the turtle hides within its shell what happens the thunderer gets frustrated because they're trying to make a connection here and I notice that you're in your shell. So I get louder, right? As the thunderer, I'm going to get louder and louder and do everything I can to connect with you. And the louder I get, the more the turtle goes, no, no, I, I don't want to be here. And, and their brain just starts to freeze and their brain starts to feel like mashed potatoes and they can't just quite form the thought and they can't catch up and it's so frustrating. And what's interesting is the two don't realize the effect that they are having on the other, right? Um, uh, it sounds like we have a couple of researchers in here, so you probably are familiar with this. Essentially what I'm talking about is fundamental attribution error. What's happening is uh, with fundamental attribution error, I assume that when you are behaving a certain way, it's because there's something wrong with you as a person. If I am behaving that way, it's because of the circumstances. So the reason why I am clamming up is because this doesn't feel like a safe environment. It's because you're being mean. But if you are, are speaking loudly, it's just because you're a jerk. It couldn't have anything to do with the circumstances. It couldn't have anything to do with my behavior. I am blaming all of your behaviors on who you are as a person, but I can justify all mine because of the circumstances. So I see this so often. I do a lot of work, as I mentioned, with different departments, different types of workplaces. And what I see is this very common thunder turtle syndrome where you have one person who gets used to speaking very aggressively. The other person is withdrawing and it's so frustrating for both of them, right? Because the thunderer just wants the connection without realizing that what they're doing is, is scaring the turtle back into its shell. And the turtle just wants to be heard and wants to feel safe and wants to be able to connect and have this nice conversation without realizing that the more they're hiding in the shell, the more the thunder wants to be loud and then the turtle is preventing the conversation. 
And it's a really difficult cycle to get out of unless there are people like you, unless there are mediators who can step in and say, aha, I know what's going on. This is the thunder turtle syndrome. Let me help to break this cycle. Let me help the two of you to figure out how to have a conversation where you both feel heard. Right? That's, that's the goal here. Okay, so these are our common amygdala behaviors. Now I want to look at Okay, good. This video is playing perfectly. This is what we wanted to happen. Um, what we want to look at is how to help our clients when they're sitting at that table to, to prioritize their prefrontal cortex, right? To be able to think from this more logical part of their brain. What happens here is our prefrontal cortex has some... Um, has some, some qualities that make it very attractive to us as mediators. First off, what I mentioned is our prefrontal cortex is much more connected to time than our amygdala is. What I mean specifically by that is our prefrontal cortex can remember past events. It can also picture future events and it can decide if what we are doing right now is worth it. Let's say, let's say that you have two partners who are getting a divorce, right? You're the divorce mediator and you can just tell that one of them is completely triggered, right? One of them is, um, uh, one of them is getting way too close to that lava spot in their brain and, um, and they're having a, a thunder response. So their amygdala has taken over. And you can tell this because your client isn't bringing up things in the past anymore. Your client isn't providing creative solutions. And oh, I guess we could do this and that would work out. No, no, no. Your client is operating completely out of their amygdala, meaning that they are only making short-term decisions. What does this sound like? It sounds like your client saying, I think I should probably go slash his tires. That would feel really good right now. That is exactly what my short-term self wants to do. Yeah, I should go and do that. That's a great idea because that satisfies the amygdala's need to deal with a threat. You can tell prefrontal cortex has, has come back online or the prefrontal cortex is the main one that's sending informational signals. When your clients start saying, oh, but you know what? I remember that my kids really wanna spend time with their dad this weekend. And so I guess that, you know, he, he really is a good dad when he takes them away on these weekend trips and they, they really are excited about spending the summer with him. They're going to go on this month-long backpacking adventure through Reykjavik. And I can picture them having such a good time. And notice now my brain is starting to connect to the past and it's starting to connect to the future. And because of that, it can make some good comparisons about deciding if my current action is worth it. Okay, does that make sense? So if you're picturing it, think of, your amygdala is kind of like Dory from Finding Nemo, right? It's just, it's doing whatever it wants in the moment. Whereas your prefrontal cortex, that's kind of more like Yoda, right? It, it's, it's much more connected to time and it can make better long-term decisions. So when someone has experienced a trauma, the amygdala's job is to protect them in the short term. But notice your prefrontal cortex also has to deal with that trauma right? It's trying to protect them long-term. So what happens here is your brain chemistry begins to change. Um, are we talking about just a couple of people who have been through really awful events? Not really. Um, by the time they have graduated from high school, it looks, the researchers say that about one in three children have experienced a trauma. Seven out of 10 adults have experienced not just something traumatic, but something that, that was so, so traumatic and awful to them that it changed their behavior and their view of their own identity. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize the effect that this has had on them. They don't understand when that little seed gets into their brain, how much those roots start to spread out and change their view of themselves in the world. A lot of people don't understand that that lava spot is in their brain because they've been successfully avoiding it for so long. So what happens here is um, uh, we have a lot of clients, seven out of 10, probably of your clients are coming to your mediation table 
without understanding their trauma, without understanding how how much of a hot spot that is in their brain, without realizing how much it has affected them. So they don't realize how quickly their amygdala is taking over and that they're not making good long-term decisions. This is your job to be able to understand, oh, you are making a short-term decision right now, right? You're probably acting out of your amygdala. We need to take a couple of steps to help you feel like this is safe, help you to regulate some of those, your breathing techniques, help you to feel grounded so that your prefrontal cortex can be the one in charge. There's one more part of your brain that I want to discuss. So if you wouldn't mind, I want you to hold your hand up again, tuck your thumb in, fold your fingers over, and there's one more spot here. So this prefrontal cortex, right? This is what we've been talking about. This is what, um, this is what connects you to time, to memories. When it flips up, right, this is your amygdala. These are like two little olives that live right here behind your ears. And this is the part that protects you short term from immediate threats. But notice these knuckles back here. Notice this part that's responsible for flipping up and down. That's essentially your hippocampus. The hippocampus is the one that says, oh, we're cool, we're cool. Everything's fine right now. Nikki is in a safe space. Prefrontal cortex can stay engaged. Or hippocampus is like, ah, I think it's a cougar. Come on, amygdala, do your job. And then the hippocampus starts prioritizing the amygdala. So this is great, right? This is a perfect system and this all works really nicely. We have long-term solutions, we have short-term solutions, we have hippocampus regulating it, it's great. However, once someone has been consistently exposed to trauma, the prefrontal cortex shrinks the hippocampus shrinks. The amygdala is much more in charge. So it's kind of like, instead of sitting here nicely, your amygdala is now like a, like if you hit your thumb with a hammer and it's all swollen, right? It's like, now you've got this big fat thumb that's taken over. What does that mean? It means that you are now dealing with people who are going to have um, a, a much more active fear response, much higher anxiety, they are much more prone to think that they are in danger, that somebody's out to get them, that people are attacking them, that people are saying something about them, that, that you're taking more than your fair share because their hippocampus isn't regulating um, those emotions the, the way it's supposed to, right? Because trauma has kind of, um, trauma has, the trauma has kind of, what's the word I want? frozen the hippocampus a little bit. It's not as, it's not flipping back and forth as easily as it's supposed to. Instead, the amygdala gets to come out and be in charge much more often. Um, years ago, I went to Disneyland and we went to the Tower of Terror. And my friends said, okay, you're going to be fine. Here's what happens. You're going to start at the top. You do like a little drop, a little drop, and then there's like one tiny drop and then you're done. Okay, so I was prepared for that, right? I can handle this. Little drop, little drop, tiny drop, I'm done, I'm good. So we did the little drop and I went, okay, huh, that was kind of scary, but it's not a big deal. Little drop, huh, okay, that's fine. And then it went up and then it did this drastic drop, which because I had been expecting something else, I thought that's it. Like we're, the ride is broken, we're all gonna die. That's it, life is over, I am done. And I like, they took pictures right then and it was awful because I'm just screaming bloody murder, right? You can see my tonsils, my mouth is open so wide. I'm just screaming, I'm convinced that this is it, I'm done. I, unfortunately, right after that, I had to get on a plane and every single bump, my amygdala went, that's it. And I kept like, like pushing against this imaginary brake pedal under my seat, like trying to slow the plane down and be in control because my amygdala was now supercharged, right? My amygdala was, was on a constant lookout for any kind of fear of falling because it had just been through something that felt very traumatic. It was, it was very scary. And so my prefrontal cortex wasn't in charge. My, the rational part of my brain wasn't saying, Claire, it's okay, it's just a little bump. It's a tiny air pocket, a little bit of turbulence. You have been on a plane a million times, you know how this feels. Right, I wasn't regulating that way. Instead, my amygdala was just taking over. I don't know about all of you, but I can think of this happening with so many of my clients where they have had this fight so many times or they have just been exposed to that constant bickering or those 
microaggressions. And because of it, their amygdala is hyper aware, right? Because of it, their amygdala is saying, they're out to get me. Oh, they're going to say it again. Oh, I know that they're just, they're going to jab or, oh, that person isn't going to do their job. And once again, I'm going to have to take over. And, and the amygdala is the one making all of these short-term decisions because people have been through something that that is traumatic. It, it scared them. It was very hard for them. Um, so what does this look like? Let's take a peek here at, um, this is a scan of, we have a typical healthy brain over here on the left, and then a brain that has been through abuse over here on the right. Notice here, um, notice how, how active the prefrontal cortex is, how involved it is and connected to the rest of the brain, right? It's, it's able to connect to these memory centers. It's able to envision. It's able to, to have some, some great creative thought. Everything is exciting. Everything is active here. Then notice someone who has been through difficult, consistent, uh, long-term pain, their brain is just rewired, right? The chemistry is different in this person's brain because of the trauma that they have experienced over and over and over. Um, this is, I feel like it's important for us to understand this because um, our clients are coming to the mediation table and we have so many people who've probably been telling them, just get over it, you're fine. It's not that big of a deal. Why are you reacting like this? And they're probably trying to, right? They're, they've probably been trying for months to just, okay, it's not that big of a deal. I don't need to react. I, I don't need to get this upset. And they're coming to your mediation table feeling like there is something really wrong with them because I'm I'm trying to keep it together, but I just, I just, I can't handle it. I'm just so afraid that they're going to say this thing to me again, or they're go there's going to be this painful thing. And so my brain has rewired itself to protect itself, right? It's, it's an amazing function of your brain, but it makes it very hard to, to keep your prefrontal cortex in control. It makes it very hard to continue to have this rational thought and, and be able to think creatively about the future when your amygdala feels like it always has to be under attack to take care of you in the moment, okay? Um, so what does this look like when we are sitting at the mediation table? Um, so this is where my book comes in. Uh, so I looked at about 20 different behaviors that are, that are common results of trauma. And this is how people present themselves at work. And essentially what's happening is you have this hot spot in your brain, and this is the way that your brain has chosen to deal with it. It might be a micromanager, right? And what that means is that they are taking a thundering approach and they're just saying, this is the way it is. You need to have that report on my desk by nine o'clock and we're not talking about it. And that's the way that their brain has kind of warped and worked its way around that trauma by it's just trying to throw down a, a thunder, or I guess it would be a lightning bolt. Um, they're just trying to throw down something very decisive saying, I'm not open to conversation about this. I'm not going to be vulnerable or transparent. I'm not willing to talk about it. I'm putting on this big, bold front because I don't want you to ask me about it because that is so painful. I can't even fathom talking about it. Or you have people who are people pleasers, right? Oh, sure. That's fine. Yeah, I can handle it. Yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, that, that sounds great because I don't want to actually have a conversation with you. I don't want to actually say, well, I'm not okay with that and here's why, or here's my interest in the situation, or here's my fear about that, because that opens me up for a conversation around this painful topic, okay? Um, you all know this, right? You're very educated. Um, we know that just because a person is, is behaving in an awful way, it doesn't mean that they're awful, right? It means that they have been through something awful and they just don't have the tools yet or they haven't had the time or the place to be able to process it. We know that our clients usually don't know that, right? They feel like there is something wrong with them or all the people around them have been telling them that there is something wrong with them. I think this is why when somebody comes to the mediation table, they feel like they have to over explain, right? They have to justify themselves. They're trying to convince you as the mediator. I'm trying to get you on my side because nobody else has believed me. No one else can understand why I'm behaving this way. They don't understand the trauma that I've been through. They don't understand how my brain has rewired 
and I feel stuck and I just need somebody to validate me and let me know that I'm okay. Um, so what, what I feel like our big job is as mediators is to let our clients know that the trauma that they are experiencing is a very normal response to an abnormal situation. Um, I took my first mediation training, my first basic mediation training about 20 years ago. <clears throat> and I have to tell you, I was taught the exact opposite thing. 20 years ago, the mediation training, the, the way that we were taught to mediate was to tell people that the world is fine. Everything's going to be okay. Things are going to continue on normally. And sometimes, yeah, it's going to be hard and that's normal. What you are doing is your brain is having a strange reaction that, that I need to help you just deal with this so that you can get back on track. In other words, I'm continuing to shame people. I am gaslighting people by telling them that they're having an abnormal response to a normal situation. Um, and I think one of the main reasons why I was taught that in my basic mediation training was that back then the power, the power was very shifted, right? Mediators were supposed to be the one in charge. We're supposed to be trusted. Like we know what we're doing. And so let me tell you, this is the way things are. And this is the way that the world works. And yeah, sometimes it's tough, but let me just give you some skills. And now you'll know how to deal with it, right? There was something wrong with the way you were dealing with it before. So let me just teach you these skills and now you can handle it. And that makes me look really tough and knowledgeable. And then you feel justified in hiring me. Thank goodness things have changed. And now we're starting to teach mediators that conflict is a normal response to a normal situation. People are going to argue sometimes and disagree and that's okay. If we're taking it one step farther, so we're not just talking about conflict now, but my clients are starting to talk about trauma. This is when I tell them, that's an abnormal situation. Why is this so important? Why do, what's the difference there? Why am I spending time on this between a normal situation and an abnormal situation? It's because it has to do with my worldview, right? If, if, we let, if we let the roots of trauma sink too far into your brain, then my understanding of the world changes. So what does that mean? Let's say, <clears throat> let's say that I continue to show up to work and I'm nice and smiling and I bring people their coffee and I ask them how their weekend was. And that is my worldview, that you treat each other nicely and people treat you nicely back. And if I give kindness, I get kindness. And that is how I see the world. But let's say I have a coworker who's just awful, right? They're just nasty. And I keep trying to be kind and getting nastiness back. This start, if it's nasty enough, this can start to become a low grade trauma and it will start to change how I see the world, right? Now I am going to see it as, oh, if you give kindness, you might not give it back because some people are selfish and they're mean and they're nasty. And now my sense of the world is starting to change. It is necessary for a mediator to come in and say, you're right, that's not normal. That is not how the world is supposed to work. When you are kind to someone, you're right, they are supposed to be kind back to you. And I mean, obviously I wouldn't say it like that, right? I'd say it with a little bit more tact, but what I'm trying to do is reinforce their worldview that says, yeah, you have been kind. You should expect to get kindness back. What you experienced was an abnormal situation. And the fact that you're closing up and you don't feel safe around them, that is a very normal response. So I need, before we can deal with any kind of trauma, before we can get close to that lava, I need to let people know that that they're safe, that they're okay, that this is a normal response, that they are doing everything right. Um, I work with a lot of therapists and, um, and it's interesting, it's interesting what it takes for someone to get close to that lava spot in their brain. Because I always, I always thought that it would be something different. I always thought that you would have to point out what was wrong with someone so that they could identify that and let it go and work on that behavior and change it. But therapists say it's actually the opposite. People need to feel accepted. They need to feel whole. They need to feel like they are good and they are seen and that they're doing okay. And only when, I can't, this is kind of cheesy, I'm sorry, but I can't think of a better image than this. It's kind of like, as if you're a kid and your parent is giving you this nice safe hug. 
and you feel like you're safe. And when you're in that safe hugged space, that's when your brain can say, all right, I can see how I should have handled this better, or I can see it's probably time for me to forgive them. And it's only when you're in that really safe, accepted space that your brain is, is able to start rewiring itself and, and it's able to finally come up to that trauma and deal with it. If a person continues to feel like there's something wrong with them, then they're always going to be up in arms, right? They're, they're holding everything tight and things become very rigid in our brain and we can't make any changes then. So if we're continue, if, if let's say your client's circle, if they're friends, if their family are continuing to point out what's wrong with them, oh, you know, you just need to go address your, that micromanager of a boss. You need to stand up for yourself. You need to bring it up. You need to, you need to have a backbone. How come you haven't dealt with this before? And they're continuing to feel like they're messing up, like they're having an abnormal response, like there's something wrong with them, then their brain isn't going to change because it, it becomes protective. It becomes very rigid. If instead they feel accepted and they feel like I'm doing the right thing, I am completely justified in how I have been behaving. I am okay. And this is something that I want to work on and improve on, right? That's when your brain can start to rewire itself and can start to slowly move through that trauma. Okay. So what are some of the outcomes of trauma? Um, again, this is mostly coming from experience in the workplace. Trauma quickly leads people to isolate. What that means is if you are working with, um, uh, I've been working with a, a big department over here at, at um, the, the Oregon Department of State, essentially. And there is a boss and she was incredibly traumatized by her staff. Um, they were very close. And then she found out that, that they had essentially been saying this nasty stuff behind her back. And it just completely destroyed her. So what did she do? She clammed up. She began locking her office at lunchtime. And her staff said, ah, you know, we always knew that she was awful. And we thought, and she thought that she was better than us. But now we know it. Like what kind of a person locks their door during lunchtime and won't even come to lunch with us? And they start saying all this nasty stuff. And she can hear it as they walk by her office. I sat and met with her. And I'm going to be honest, this was about four months in, and we had met multiple times before she was even willing to turn her video on and start to share with me what happened. So about four months in, and she says, you know, Claire, they're right. I do lock my door at lunchtime. And then I sit against it and I pull my knees up into my chest and I cry and I cry and I cry because I hear them going to lunch together without me. And they're not inviting me the way that they used to. And instead of confronting me when they had an issue with me, they just all talked about me behind my back. And I thought that we were friends. And that was my worldview, that we could communicate openly and honestly with each other. But they didn't do that. And that shook my worldview. And it shook my sense of, my, of myself. I thought that I was somebody who was very approachable. And I thought I was an open door manager. And I just, I, I can't be around them anymore. And I don't even want to be around myself. I'm just, I'm humiliated. I'm furious. I can't deal with it. So she completely isolated. Um, I see this so often in the workplace. There's another manager I can think of. Um, her team confronted her and it was so traumatic that she took seven weeks paid mental health leave sitting at home. I mean, that would, I'm going to be honest, that would kind of be nice to get paid to, to be at home for seven weeks. But just the idea that that everybody in her office hated her, she just couldn't she couldn't face it, right? It was this major hot spot in her brain, and she didn't have any help or support. So she just kept avoiding it, right? She was just turtling it. And every day she was like, "Nope, I can't, I can't. I'm not going to go to work. I'm not going to do it because it was so traumatic. Um, there's another company that I've been working with, and uh, there was a manager who was having a really awful day. We had a new hire. It was her first day. And the manager just kept snapping at her and jabbing at her. And, and so the new hire filed a TRO, right? A temporary restraining order against her boss that was in place for a year. So for the first year that she was working there, they had to come up with all these creative solutions. Like, okay, what time are you going to walk into the boardroom? Okay, then I'll walk out a minute before so you can come into the meeting. And it, it was 
it was crazy. But when you start to understand the trauma that was causing it, then you can understand why people are reacting this way, right? They just didn't, they didn't have the skills. They didn't have the tools. They didn't know what was going on. Okay. Um, so what does this look like? What does this isolation look like for our clients? Uh, U.S. Surgeon General is pretty worried about it, right? Saying that um, that loneliness is becoming one of the biggest epidemics that is facing our workplace. Um, I thought this one was pretty interesting, that social isolation increases the risk for premature death by about 26%, 29%. It is as destructive as about 15 cigarettes a day. Um, last year for 2023, mental health, and, and the effects of a traumatized mental health were the most expensive medical expense for the US workforce, beating out obesity, cancer, smoking, all of it. So all of those medical expenses, mental health is now more expensive than all of those. And when you think about it, it makes sense because when somebody is going through something traumatic at work, they say that they start to sink into extreme depression, that about 34% of their day, their brain is trying to deal with the conflict, right? I'm just playing it over and over in my mind. I'm imagining what I would say. I'm not really working for about 34% of my time. And I start to suck other people into it. And then I'm not showing up at work and I'm quiet quitting. And so that's why it's become the, the most expensive um, factor in our workplace right now, because because we're starting to become more aware of our mental health, which is fantastic. Most employees just don't have the skills to know how to deal with it, right? So it's like, now, okay, I know that there's a problem, but I also know I don't have the tools to deal with this problem. So that's why I love talking about this because I feel like it's so important for us to, for us to help people, for us to teach them these skills. Okay, so what is it that really harms our mental health? It's three things. Um, Obviously, right now, I'm speaking in generalities. I'm not talking about medical issues or clinical diagnoses. Um, I'm just talking about when, um, when someone who would otherwise be considered healthy that would have strong mental health, these are the things that start to threaten it and to attack it. So it's these three things. First, confusion. It's, it's not understanding what's going on. Like, why is someone treating me this way? How come I can't make progress with this? How come I can't work through this issue? How come... I can't talk to them, what's going on? It's that confusion and that lack of clarity that can be very discouraging. And so this makes us stall because if I don't know what's going on, I can't come up with a plan. What's that army motto? Uh, it's something like once you have, once you've figured out what the problem is, you're halfway to solving it. The actual motto is much snappier than that. Hopefully somebody puts it in the chat. Um, but not being able to understand what's going on with the problem means that we also cannot come up with a plan. Nikki, do you see it? I think it's no, well, I, you're just making me think of GI Joe, which is knowing is half the battle. <laughs> so I maybe I bastardized that for cartoon land. I love it. <laughs> um, so when our brains don't understand what's going on, right? Uh, somebody said something cruel to me or somebody was, was, pushing me out, or there are these microaggressions happening in the workplace, then I become very confused about what's happening. I can't, I don't know what to do. And then I start to become hopeless. A few years ago, we did a mediation and mental health conference. I'll be honest, I think it's the, the favorite conference that, that we have done at mediate.com. It was definitely, it was just incredible. Our speakers were so vulnerable and open and honest. I think a couple of you, DG, I think you might've been there. Maria, I'm wondering if you might've stepped in for a little bit. It's incredible. We have a lot of the sessions available for free. I'm happy to send them to you. But we had some people come in who had attempted suicide and um, they were unsuccessful attempts. And, um, and what was really interesting was they said, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't actually the circumstances it was not knowing how to deal with them. It was feeling like I wasn't going to be able to get through this. I didn't have the tools to solve this. And I hear this over and over where I have workers who are so discouraged and they say, I, I will do the work. Like I'm showing up at my job, planning on working. 
I just don't know how. I don't have the skills. I don't know how to work through this. And that's what is so devastating. That's what's making me feel hopeless. It's not that there's something hard in front of me. Okay, this is really important. There's always going to be hard things. It's not that the thing itself is too hard. It's that I don't have the skills to work through it. Again, this is where I feel like you and your skills are so necessary because, because bad things are happening all around us. What we need to do is, is help people figure out, okay, how do we talk about this? How do we connect through this? So what happens when we can come in and help people talk through things is now they start to have clarity, right? If I can tell someone you are having a normal response, this is a typical trauma response, or this is a thunder turtle syndrome, or that is an abnormal situation, you continuing to be kind to someone and them not being kind back to you, that would that would be hurtful for anyone. So I'm I'm trying to provide some clarity. And this is right, this is basic mediation 101. It's just, it's validating, it is reframing. It is applying vocabulary to a situation. It is clarifying and validating in somebody's brain that they're having a normal response. And then the next thing that we do right after we validate is we move on to plan. So we help them to move through the next steps. What we have just done is we have given them hope, right? We are helping their brain to say, you're gonna get through this. There is going to be an answer. Things are going to get better. We are going to go back to that worldview where things are okay. We're going to go back to your sense of identity where you, you feel okay about yourself. And then what's great, this is what I really love about this, is then the next time somebody faces that difficult situation, they're prepared, right? They already have the vocabulary to know what's going on. Oh, I get it. I get it now. Okay, this is a thunder turtle syndrome. I understand this. Um, I, I think some of you were in the the talk that Dan Burstein and I did um, a few months ago. Um, this one was ah, this one was was pretty tough for me because I did my dissertation on this. I wrote a book on this. I know this stuff. I can diagnose this instantly in other people. I didn't realize I was doing this. So um, Dan, for those of you that know, he he can be very aggressive, right? He can thunder. He can give out a ton of information very quickly and expect an immediate response. And that started to feel overwhelming for me and I was turtling. And the more I was withdrawing, like I wouldn't respond to his emails or I would take a couple of days and maybe just give a one word response or I would forward it to somebody else and say, oh, I think this is for you, you should do it, right? And I was completely turtling. I was absolutely avoiding the situation. I didn't wanna deal with it because because I was starting to feel attacked, right? It was starting to feel like a hot spot in my brain. And the more that I turtled, what did Dan do? He became much more aggressive, right? He became much more, um, but Claire, I, I'm just trying to talk to you about this. Claire, how come we can't just connect? And so he's getting so frustrated because he's like, Claire, but this is an issue and we need to deal with this. And so he kept thundering, which you know wasn't the right response. And I kept turtling, which wasn't the right response. And it finally, and I remember I was sitting giving a talk like this when it just, it like hit me upside the head. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm turtling. I have been, I have been turtling. I have been treating Dan horribly. I've been blowing him off and I was really embarrassed. And I had to call him up and apologize because in retrospect, even though he had become a little too aggressive, all he was trying to do was talk to me. Right? He, he was trying to get me to understand that I had some articles on mediate.com, which could, um, which could reinforce, uh, which could be slightly discriminatory. And once I looked at it, I could see where he was coming from. And he was just getting frustrated that I wasn't willing to have the conversation. So I had to call him up and apologize. And I cried and he cried. But then I had clarity on what was happening. We had a plan about it. So now I have very firm boundaries in place. We still work together a lot, but now I can tell him, hey, I'm feeling I'm feeling like I'm ready to turtle, right? This is feeling a little too much for me. So we have a clear plan and he's fantastic at respecting that. And he says, okay, I'll back off. How about we reconnect in a couple of weeks? Perfect. Then I don't turtle, right? But then I can still stay engaged in the conversation. This has given my brain a lot of hope. And now I feel prepared, right? Because then... The next time I'm working with somebody who's kind of a thunderer, I get it. I, I can understand. I know what's happening. I can recognize those signs in me when I start to turtle. 
and I know how to handle this now. So, so this is honest, it's been really good for my, for my mental health to be able to understand my responses and to see how quickly I was falling into that thunder turtle syndrome. I don't know, maybe it's just me. I'm sure that all of you are much more evolved and perfect, but anyway, so I did it. I was, I was the turtler. So this sounds lovely, right? We can do this for our clients. We know how to validate. We know how to reframe. Um, so what does, what does this, all of this mean? Um, Colin, Colin Rule, right over at mediate.com where I work. Um, he says that this is Ellie fiving it. I didn't know what that meant. I had to look it up because I didn't want to feel silly or embarrassed in front of him. So I agreed with him and nodded in the conversation. Then I went and looked it up. So LE5 means explain it like I'm five, like take these, these trauma concepts and then tell me what does that actually mean to me when I am sitting at a mediation table, how can I use this information? So essentially when somebody who has been traumatized, uh, when someone's been traumatized, they start to exhibit these very avoidant or aggressive behaviors. And we can picture that now, right? You can picture this, this lava spot in their brain and their brain tries to avoid it by going under it or by just being aggressive and shutting down the conversation. So what, if, if this starts to present itself at the mediation table, remember, I'm not a counselor. I'm not an attorney. I, I don't want that job. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist. Last thing that I want to do. But if someone wants to be able to work through a conflict at the mediation table, what I can do is make the place safe enough, right? Just like that image before, just like your parent who's holding you when you're a kid. I want them to have that feeling where I'm just holding them and, and their brain so that their brain is safe enough so that they can start to approach the conflict and figure out what's going on. That's how they can find clarity, right? That first step towards protecting their mental health. So remember this image a while ago, I was saying that um, there's this painful thing. And if it's outside of our window of tolerance, then that's when your prefrontal cortex flips offline and your amygdala takes over, okay? So this window of tolerance, um, this can continue to expand. Let me give you an example. My son, when he was younger, I don't know, like three, maybe even younger, I, he was running and fell down, scraped his knee pretty badly, right? And it starts bleeding. And I remember him looking up at me with this absolute terror, probably just like my face on that Tower of Terror ride. And he has this absolute terror. And he looks at me and says, mom, but there's, there's blood. Like the, the blood is, is leaving my body. I, I'm going to have no blood left. Mom, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to die. And he was absolutely convinced, right? He was so, so terrorized. And so I came over and I held him. I said, it's okay, buddy. I'm sure it must really hurt, but it's okay. Let me show you what to do. So we went to the bathroom and I showed him how to wash it off. We got the Neosporin. We had these cool little Wonder Woman band-aids that I put on his knee and then he was okay. The pain was still there, but what happened was his window of tolerance expanded. So the next time he had a scraped knee, it still hurt, right? Absolutely. The pain still hurts. And he, he rushed over to me, right? He needed that little hug. And then he went into the bathroom and he washed off his knee put some Neosporin on it, pulled out the Wonder Woman Band-Aid, put it on his knee. And now his window of tolerance has expanded. This, this is how we grow, right? This is how our brains mature. This is how we learn how to work through difficult things. A lot of us think that that is supposed to stop when we're 18, like suddenly we've become adults without realizing that the painful things, like, oh, I just couldn't possibly talk to that person. Oh, I couldn't confront them. Oh, I, I would never say that that those things that feel like they're outside our window of tolerance, that we can figure out how to continue to talk about them and deal with difficult things. And this is how our brains are supposed to continue to mature and grow so that even if we're, even if we're facing something that's really hard, our prefrontal cortex can stay in control. So uh, let's look at this differently. So in our brain, right, let's say we have these um, two different synapses. We have one that is a thought. I have a thought in my brain over here that says people can be good athletes. And I have this other thought that says people can be a girl, female identifying. They are presenting as a female and those are two different thoughts. Okay, and those, those sit separately. And now I think I've turned off the volume on this. We should be good, fingers crossed. Okay, yay, 
did it right. So what we are seeing here is we have two neurons, right? We have these two separate thoughts that are connecting, right? This is beautiful. This is an epiphany. This is our window of tolerance expanding. This is us working through something that was traumatic. So that's what, that's what it looks like inside of our brain. What just happened there was I formed a connection between two thoughts. So, even, so this hot spot that has been in my brain that I have been avoiding for so long, I was finally able through this very safe space to work through it and form the connection that says there can be good athletes and there can be girls and those can be the same. I have that connection now, right? That's what that looks like. Um, and this is what neuroplasticity looks like, where I have two separate thoughts and then I am able to form a new connection in there. Okay. Um, so in other words, the, the essence of communication is that we're trying to provide a safe space to talk about difficult things, right? This allows two neurons to form a new connection. So my one of my employees might think, oh, Bill is such, Bill is so mean. And then I have another thought that says, I can forgive people and move on. Neuroplasticity allows us to form that connection, right? Those two thoughts that were separate, it allows us to form that link between that says, you know what? I can forgive Bill. Bill was mean. I'm, I'm not denying that thought, right? I'm not pretending like that didn't happen, but I can also figure out how to forgive Bill and to work around him. Um, Oh, that picture's not pulling up. Okay, I want to talk for just a second about myokines. Um, if any of you are big exercisers or you you read the news, you've probably been hearing about these. These are known as the hope molecules. Um, I talked about this a little bit yesterday. I think some of you were in that talk, so I apologize. But this can be your break time to go get a cup of coffee. So myokines are this fun molecule, and they are released when your muscles go through... When your muscles um, lift something that's very heavy and hard. So let's say that this is a 25 pound dumbbell and I've only been able to lift 20. I've really been trying, right? I've been trying. I've been pushing myself. I've been eating my kale. I've been stretching. And then one day at the gym, like I really struggle and I struggle, but I do it. And I lift that 25 pound weight. And you know what my body just did? My body went, yay, you can do hard things. You are getting better and stronger and you are improving. And even if you don't think you can do something, if you put the time into it and you train, you can do hard things and get better. And there is a direct correlation and payoff there between hard work and improvement. So my brain releases these myokines, which are these hope molecules, which um, which tell your body that you can move through difficult experiences. And that is exactly what is happening when we are sitting at the mediation table. And there was this, let's say you have two clients that, that aren't speaking to each other and they just couldn't imagine it, right? It's outside of my window of tolerance that is too painful. But then with your help, you give them some tools, you start to guide them through that conversation. Then what happens is their brain is starting to feel hope because they they talked to each other. It was probably still painful, but also hopefully they didn't die. They lived through it. And the fact that they lived through it starts to release hope inside their brain, okay? This is crucial because now they are starting to realize I can talk to this person and I can survive, right? This is where that neuroplasticity starts to come in because we're starting to slowly shift my concepts and my approaches and and I am able to talk to people and have those hard conversations. All right. Um, let me tell you, um, I want to tell you really quickly this story. And then I want some time for questions. So when I, I went to Gonzaga for my undergrad and my roommate was from Hawaii. Um, she's still, she's still one of my best friends. Um, Leslie, she's a child psychologist. And because she was from Hawaii, um, her, her whole family, they were wonderful. Um, it was, it's, they kind of, there's that Asian culture, right? That Asian influence. And the whole family came over from Hawaii, came here to support her. And before she moved in, they hit the dollar store and they essentially bought the entire dollar store, right? So that was our dorm room. Like just the entire dollar store was sitting there. And in springtime, her, her tradition is they make malasadas. They're kind of like these donut holes. And we thought freshmen in a dorm room 
we should make malasadas. We should make donut holes. This seems very safe. So we got this hot pot. We filled it with boiling oil. And we rolled our little donut holes in it and rolled them in sugar and sat and ate them. And they were delicious. They were so delicious. If you haven't had a fresh malasada, you absolutely have to make one. They're incredible. And then she said, okay, we should clean up. We should, we should do something with the hot oil. And I said, obviously, let's pour it into your dollar store bowl. And she, she's so much smarter. She's like, Claire, I don't, I don't feel like that's a good idea. And I was like, hello, Leslie, like feel it. You know, it's, it's hard. It's plastic. It's going to be fine. And she trusted me for some reason. So we picked up this big pot of boiling oil and poured it into the dollar store bowl. And then we sat on the floor, crisscross applesauce, and we picked up our malasadas and we ate them. And then we start to feel like this hot burning coming down our legs. Oh God, it was so gross. It was so gross. It spread all across our dorm room floor. Like our socks, our binders, our, our textbooks, everything. It was covered in this like hot, sticky oil, which had sugar wrapped in it at this point. It was so gross. It was so gross. But the good thing is, I learned a little bit about neuroplasticity. What I learned specifically was that our brains can change, even though they feel really hard, right? Just like that red plastic bowl. If you give them a little bit of, um, if you give them pressure. And so what I mean by that is, if somebody is feeling like they're ready to change, like I am sick of, of my amygdala always being in control. I'm sick of always being afraid. I am sick of not being able to talk to my boss or to my partner or to my kids, or I'm, I'm sick of being so reactive and just shouting at people all the time. And so that pressure says, okay, we need to do things differently. And then giving them time, right? So the hot oil sat in that bowl for a few minutes before it, before it found its way through there. And what it did was it found its way through it created a new path for itself right it started to go into a new direction and this is the other essential piece for neuroplasticity it's not enough to just say um oh you need to forgive them what you need to do as mediators is to help people to think of how they want things to be right this is getting cheesy but just go with me for a second this is where some of that visualization stuff comes in because when our subconscious can see something, it reacts as if it's real. So if it can see a future where I bring something up to my partner without yelling at them, or I walk in and I feel prepared and confident and I, I raise my point to my boss and it goes okay and my boss hears me and respects me, or I speak to my teenage kid who can just be a jerk, but we're able to laugh through something and have a good time. And I can picture that, right? Then your subconscious holds on to that. And now it has a new path. And if I do that repeatedly and I give myself time to, for my brain to form those new connections, then my brain starts to rewire itself, right? Remember those brain pictures that we were looking at earlier? If people really try doing this, right? I really try picturing that I'm going to speak to my partner in a different way. And I, I work through what am I going to say and how am I going to be prepared and what the end result is going to be. This isn't instant. I am so sorry. I have no magic wand. It's not instant. It takes a couple of months. But continuous brain scans show that over those couple months, if I am intentional about it, right, it, and I feel safe and I feel like I'm doing a good job here, my brain has that nice warm hug. I give myself a couple months, then your brain starts to rewire itself. My prefrontal cortex starts to be in more control. I start to have um, uh, that sense of serotonin. I start to feel like things are peaceful. I'm starting to have more of a sense of hope of working through things instead of being so reactive, okay? Um, so let me, let me give you a quick summary here. Um, if we want to go through changes ourselves or if we want to help our clients, we have to give them a space to vent initially, right? We know this. Uh, tell me what's going on. Help me to understand what brought us here. Tell me your side of the story. Tell me how things have been difficult, right? So you have to begin by giving them that ability to vent so that they can explain their situation. Then we validate, right? This is where we come in and we say, you are completely normal. You are having a normal response. That behavior is, is absolutely understandable. 
what you have been through is is difficult and and that sounds very hard that sounds very frustrating right so i'm validating them they're having a normal response to an abnormal situation and then we work together to come up with a plan obviously you want them to be as involved as possible because now they're starting to feel empowered like they can take control and what's starting to happen here right first off there are those immediate great mental health benefits I usually can do a check-in, right? Because I'm lucky I get to work with workplaces. So I get to do check-ins about every month or so with them. And what is so beautiful, for those of you that aren't able to come back and visit with your clients, I'm, I'm sorry, because that is such an amazing experience. You come up with a plan, right? And in the middle of it, they're still kind of, they're still in shock. They're still figuring it out. But you come back a few months later and you can watch as their brain is starting to think about things differently and they're not as fearful and there's not as reactive and there isn't as much anxiety and the workplace isn't as toxic. And it's just because they started to go through that healing process where they learn how to talk to each other. Oh, it is just beautiful. Like if you could just bottle that up and sell it, you'd make a billion bucks. There's just something so beautiful about seeing people going through that. So, so this is what we get to do, right? As mediators, it's beautiful. We are taking that time even though it can take a lot of time to provide that safe space, to, let, to be patient, to let people know that we care, take all that time in the lesson to validate their experience, to clarify that things have been hard, and then to work with them to create a plan. What this is doing long-term is it's helping people to be okay with that lava spot, to slowly approach it, to talk about it, to work through it, and then their brain starts to accept it. They start to pull that, that nasty idea out of their head. Things like, oh, girls can't be athletes. They start to face that and say, no, you know what? That was a lie. I am pulling that out of my brain. And instead I'm replacing that with, girls can be dang good athletes. Some of the best. And then I start to replace that lava in my brain with that sense of hope and acceptance, right? My brain starts to produce these these lovely myokines, the serotonin, and all this wonderful stuff is happening. So that is, um, that's in, that's what I picture happening when I'm sitting with clients. I'm just picturing all the stuff happening in their brain that they have these, that their, that their brains are starting to form these connections, right? That they're able to slowly come up to those hot spots and accept them and talk through them and start to achieve some peace around them so that they can figure out how to work around each other, right? So they can, so that they don't have to feel crippled by this lava spot sitting in their brain, but that they can start to feel the sense of hope. Like I, I can do hard things. I can have these hard conversations and come out of it successfully. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I really do wanna have a little bit of time here for questions. So I'm trying to end a touch early. Um, but for you, and, and again, I just want to encourage for your clients, um, I have so many people say, oh, well, this is just the way I am, right? I'm just, I'm just a narcissist, or he's just a micromanager, or yeah, I just can't deal with that. I can't talk about those situations. And what I really encourage my clients is to kind of change that, that wording and to say, yeah, you know, maybe not yet, but if that's something that you want to change, then you absolutely can, right? I don't think we have to be limited. I don't think we have to be stuck and to say, um, oh, I just don't talk to that kind of person. I don't deal with that kind of situation. But like, maybe you could. And I'm not saying that we have superpowers, right? You can't just suddenly imagine that, oh, I can fly and so I can fly. Um, but if there are things about, about our brains that have been holding us back, then I do really believe that this neuroplasticity stuff works and it allows us to reshape those pathways and to gain more control, even in the difficult situations. So, um, you know, I, like I said, I've been studying, I've been actively mediating for about the last 20 years. Um, and what I love, and I hope this has been your experience as well, is the more I lean into this, the more I realize like, this stuff actually works. It's so cool. The more I see people talk with each other and be willing to be vulnerable and forgive and explain their interests and listen to the other person, isn't it just magical how it actually works? I love it. So anyway, so I hope that you've had those, those same experiences as well. Um, oh, yes, I wanted to tell you, thank you so much, Nikki, for sharing that. Um, if you are interested in this topic, there have been some amazing resources coming up in the chat and um, 
And I would love to continue this conversation. If you're interested in this particular book, I'm happy to give a 30% off of it over at roman.com. You just have to enter that RLF and F. I think it stands for Roman Littlefield and Fowler. I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, RLF and F30 at roman.com. Uh, I would love to connect. Um, obviously, I like talking about all of this. So I would love to, to be able to connect. There's work phone. There's my email. Um, and I have a lot of resources over at Lighthearted Guide and at clairefowler.com. So with that being said, let me stop and would love to just hear from all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much. Um, now is the time when, when you can raise your virtual hand or uh, unmute yourself. Just um, if, if anybody has something to say, uh, please feel free to jump in right now. Otherwise, I just wanted to, there were a couple of questions that came in over the chat. Mm -hmm. One of them was, um, how can you translate this to, uh, or is it possible to translate this, uh, this research and the, and the positive impact into a session that's just a mediation session where you don't have the months of exposure and opportunity to connect? If you could comment on, on useful tips for, for yeah. a shorter timeline, maybe. Yeah, I think that probably what everybody is already doing is um, we're, we're probably on the same path. I just want to reiterate the importance of giving people that vocabulary. So helping them to understand why are you having this reaction? Why are you feeling that way? That this is normal, that you are going through a thunder turtle syndrome or you are having a freeze response. And that's why you're having a hard time in this conversation, but giving them that vocabulary, right? So then we are validating that experience and the more they can be involved in the plan. So the more they can say, um, I, I need this to be first on the agenda, or I need, um, uh, I need it to be written this way, right? The more we can empower people, then they start to feel that sense of safety where they can finally start to work through their trauma. Um, in the middle of a session, when it's, it's very heated, Am I going to say, oh, I can see that you're traumatized and we're getting close to that? And probably not. Um, but I have had that conversation many times when we're in a private caucus session and I just let them know, hey, I can I can see we've tried to talk about this three times now. And every time I do, you you I can see your face become your face becomes flushed, your knee starts tapping and you instantly change the subject. I just wanted to check and see if you were aware of that. It feels to me like like your brain is playing the floor is lava. Like there's this hot spot in your brain and it just keeps trying to avoid it. Um, I don't know if that's something that you want to work through today or if it's something that you want to go take the time to work through on your own, but I can see that that this is something you want to talk about, but your brain doesn't feel like it's ready, right? So a lot of times privately, I'll just kind of gently call out what I see and not in a judgy way, just I start to call out those physical um those those physical displays of it thank you so much i think that's probably all we have time for i mean you've given us such a a rich vocabulary and a dense set of tools like any good lava cake you know <laughs> that can <Yeah>. transform <laughs> into into something hopeful uh, and we all know a, a good lava cake can't be beat um so uh i wanted to just thank you officially uh again for for sharing all of this excellent information. Um, we will be posting the recording of this session on the ACR GNY website and soon on the CUNY Dispute Resolution Center website. Um, I usually get it up by the beginning of the weekend if I'm uh, good about it, although my power might go out with a snowstorm here. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and we'll be sure to put all of the the links that everybody has shared and that you shared. Um, and I just do encourage everybody to, to check out the book, you know, use the the discount, the the bump and, uh, and, and thank you so much. Uh, I think there were some really great conversation even before we started and great connections that were made. So we really appreciate your time. Uh, I, I know you said you can stay a, a few minutes afterwards, Maria, I wanted to give you the floor again to, to, to thank you and, and thank you again for booking uh, Dr. Fowler. <laughs> I wanna echo everything that Nikki has said. Oh. Um, I hope that you get to take a look at the chat and all the love that's being sent your way. Thank you so, so much. Um, we will stay on for just a, a few minutes, no later than 10.15 for anyone who wants to stay. 
at this point, we are going to turn off the recording. Nikki, can you stop the recording? And